Hi everyone, it's me, Tim, and today I want to talk about my university class in game design. This isn't a new thing, this isn't something I'm teaching. I want to tell you about a class I taught at the University of California, Irvine, in the spring of 99. Now, I've got my glasses on because I actually found my course notes. I have an overview, which is what I'm going to go over, but I actually have the individual lecture notes for each one of these. But since each one was an hour, it would take me, it's a 10 week course, it would take me 10 hours to go over them all. So instead, I'm going to go over an overview of what this class was and what I taught. It was ICS 180G, which was a information and computer science project class. It was intended for third or fourth year students but it was open to non-computer science students, which turned out to be really important because since this is a project class, some of those non-computer science students were really in demand when it came to breaking up into teams. People who could make music, people who could do art, uh, people who had really good writing skills, they were in demand, but I'll get to that. Um, just as a background real quick, I got my master's degree in computer science and AI at UCI in 1989. And I was in the PhD program, but I left in 91. That's when I went to Interplay contractually making Bard's Tale construction set. And then I moved in early 92 and became a full-time programmer at Interplay. And that's when I made Rags to Riches. So it was a few years later when I got contacted by the university and said, hey, would you teach a class in game development? And I was like, sure, let's do this. So I worked with Dan Frost, a professor there. It was a 10 week course and I'll go through what we did in each week. He taught Monday, or I'm sorry, he taught, it was Tuesday, Thursday. He taught Tuesday, I taught Thursday. I only have the notes on what I went over. So I will go over this. Um, week by week. So let's start. So week one, uh, we actually met on April 6th, which was a Tuesday, and he had me introduce myself to the class and go over what I had done. And then on April 8th, I lectured on how the industry works. And the topics I covered were publishers versus developers, internal versus external development, subcontractors, game genres and I not only went over each game genre but I had sales information because they all sell differently. Um, the one I remember is RPGs have really long tails meaning an RPG can come out and it'll still be selling years later unlike flight sims which pretty much do 90% of their sales in the first six months. Uh, I also talked about consoles and the Mac because those are getting to be a big thing. I talked about the mythical 18 month development cycle, which now I laugh at because now it's three years, five years, eight years. But back then, games were supposedly made in a year and a half. I taught, I described what an alpha was and a beta and then going gold. I talked about how to get a contract, how to start a company, because by then I was a year into Troika. I talked about self publishing, which is when you have a company that both publishes games and makes games. Monolith had just started doing that. I talk about direct sales and I did a comparison on how much money it would take if you wanted to make a million dollars, how many units you'd have to sell in direct sales versus self-publishing versus published. It was quite a bit of a difference. People were quite shocked. And then I ended up week one talking about retailers and things you have to do to get on the shelf, to get an end cap, to get posters up, just a bunch of things you have to do, about sizes of boxes, just a million things. So that was week one. Week two, I talked about teams, and this was important because very soon, I believe at the end of this week, they had to break up into teams. I talked about how teams are done in the industry. They're usually assigned, but not always, and I talked about how Fallout, I got to attract some people to it. I talked about how sometimes a game is matched to a particular team. If it's team has a particular strength, graphics, networking, 
I talked about once you have a team, how you as match up assignments to team members. And I went out of my way to say, I thought the number one element of that was the person's interest. And number two was their ability. Now you didn't want to assign something to someone that if they couldn't do it, but you also didn't want to assign something to someone if they didn't want to do it, if they had no interest in it. That, that put me at odds with a number of other producers at Interplay at the time. I talked about how to keep up motivation on a project, uh, handling problem team members, which came up. I talked about the difficulties of being both a manager and a programmer and a designer. So basically having to be running the team and on the team at the same time. And I talked about the importance of meetings. Yes, this was April 15th, 1999. And I was explaining to people why meetings were very important. To this day, People deny that meetings are important. And to this day, I repeatedly tell them how wrong they are. So I was telling them back then, too many meetings is a bad thing. But when somebody tells you meetings are dumb, we should never have meetings, that's not a person I want to work with. So week three, April 22nd, I went over design docs. I've kind of done a, already a video here about it. I talked about the separating a design doc into engine specifications versus the game specifications, which a lot of publishers want. Talked about the importance of writing, of writing the background story so that people understood what world was being made with that game. Then design specifications for the game story itself, for locations, for different levels, for missions, for quests, anything that has to do with the game. Characters that you're going to make in the game and characters that the player can create. I talked about artwork and I broke it up into game artwork and UI because those are often done in wildly different styles and by different artists. I talked about making and maintaining schedules and I talked about estimating costs. I'm not good at the last one and I warned them they wouldn't be good either so they had to be flexible. If they think they're going to estimate things precisely, well, they're going to have trouble in this class. I said, be ready to be flexible, be ready to drop features. Be ready to have to do a little extra work to get something in if you really want it. Week four was April 29th. I talked about, um, this one was a little more technical. I, I was saying I'm talking to the programmers today. Talked about how to choose an algorithm uh, because there's lots of different algorithms you can choose and often best isn't possible. You either don't have the memory, time, or there simply isn't a known good algorithm for the th task you're trying to solve. I talked about texture mapping in open space 3D worlds, how you have to do, make multiple texture maps to reduce level of detail when things are distant. I talked about pathfinding in a large world because I had done a pathfinding for Fallout and I was in the midst of writing pathfinding for Arcanum. Uh, I talked about when you make sprites, either how they're 2D or 3D, how to make the hot, how to find the hot spot, which is the point the sprite is rooted at so when it animates it doesn't move around so you know when a two or three dimensional sprite enters a collision volume remember this predates having an engine that did this for you so i explained to people how to do this i talked about the importance of caching art and other assets because 99 percent of the time back then your available memory was way less than the memory the game needed to run so you had to handle swapping and caching assets yourself I went into detail on memory management. Um, this is where it really got technical, where I talked about malloc, realloc, and free. I talked about the difference between uh, calling exit uh, to shut down your program versus freeing up all the memory first. I talked about the difference between having a something fail versus having it return null. I talked about how to manage inventory, both as a programmer, as user interface, and then how the players might think of it. And I reminded them that bin packing, which is if you have a grid and you're doing inventory on a grid, bin packing is MP complete. So keep that in mind when you make an algorithm to compress someone's inventory for them, which we did in Arcanum. I also ended up that lecture with the difference between C versus C++. I went into detail on both of them, why you may want to use C still. I was using C for Arcanum, but I was leaning towards C++. And by the time we went to Vampire in 2001, 
we were in C++. Notice I didn't mention C Sharp. I didn't learn C Sharp until 2005. So this was 1999, I didn't talk about it. Week five were student pitches. We had broken them, everybody in the uh, class, and I believe there was about 60 people, there might've been 80. We had broken them up into teams. We Week five was them pitching us. That the, the day I came in, that Thursday, instead of me talking to them, I said, pretend I'm a publisher and pitch me. So they gave me their pitches and I gave them two responses. This is what I think a publisher would say. And then this is my recommendation to you. Um, for most of them, it was, I think you can do what you're doing. You may have to reduce scope. Uh, I have questions about this. You didn't really explain how this is gonna work. I need more information about this. Um, I would recommend, because remember they had to have it make a demo. They had to have a project, a demo done by the end of the class, that was their grade. I recommended scope and content for their demo. So that was week five. So week six, which was May 13th, I talked about artisan programmers uh, because that was an interesting way. Designers were somewhere in the middle, but artists tended to be one side of the brain and programmers were the other. And I talked about how they could communicate, how I tended to do it. Um, I was often in between artists and programmers. I brought up Jason Anderson, who I started Troika with, who was the most the best person I had met to date at being able to bridge the gap between programmers and artists, which is why he was called the technical artist on Fallout. Talked about what that is. Uh, talked about how ideas flow back and forth between these different groups. Talked about who makes final decisions, when it should be the lead programmer, when it should be the lead artist, and when it has to be the project lead. I talked about technical skills I felt artists should have, things they should understand about their computer, and the tools they're using. And I ended up with a list of things that I knew artists hated about working with programmers. So I said, programmers, listen to me when I say this list, because most of the artists you're working with in this room probably think this about you. <laughs> I probably stirred some things up there. Week seven, May 20th, was interface issues. I talked about interface, because for, this has always been a big thing. It's still a big thing. Making interfaces are one of the biggest time sinks in any game you will make. Seriously, when I'm working on my Unity fun toys that I did a video back months ago, I almost always stop when I hit interface because interface to me is just, I don't enjoy coding it, but it's super important. So it's in my brain going, you have to do this, but I don't want to, but it's important, I know. I told them too little interface can be non-intuitive because there was a big push towards, I want nothing on the screen. Too much is overwhelming. It's like somewhere in there, there's a game, but it's being obscured by this interface. Usually though, the rule is less is more. So if you can figure out a way of doing an interface with fewer elements, that's a win. I talked about when to use a keyboard versus when to use mouse. Um, I hadn't made a console game at that point, but I talked about then when you make it on a console and you have a controller, how you're gonna map those things and that some things that are at the, on the interface level are easier to do if you have a mouse and other things are easier to do if you have a controller and it's hard to make the same interface work well for both. Remember, this is 99 and we're talking about that stuff. I ended up with a caveat of thinking about multiplayer early and I put this in the interface section because this is what people always forget about all the extra interface stuff that's needed if you make a multiplayer game. And I'm not just talking lobby, I'm talking once you get in the game, telling players from NPCs, having a player group, all the extra interface elements you get if you have a party, think about that early. Because if people learn how to play the single player game, they don't want the multiplayer version to be dramatically different in terms of interface. Week eight, which was May 27th, I talked about all the different kinds of development jobs. Programmers, I talked about scripter, junior, senior lead. For producers, I talked about assistant, associate, and senior. For directors, I talked about division directors, technical directors, art directors, QA director, music director. For artists, there was junior, senior lead. For QA, there were juniors, staff level and lead. For musicians, I broke, I, I didn't know how they broke them up. I never had anyone say, I'm a senior musical person. It was usually sound effects, music, and music was broken up into MIDI and digital. Um, then there were lots of non-development jobs and I just, I listed them real quick to just go, there are so many people who are supporting what you're doing that you don't see every day. 
marketing people, sales people, uh, PR, press relations people, production people, admin. These are the people that make all those players be able to play your game. And then I finished up that one. Now that I described what all jobs of, I gave my advice on how to land a job. And yes, even back then I was saying, you got to make a demo. Now that there's game engines out, I pretty much say make a demo. So week nine was when they presented their projects to us. And it was interesting. I think we did it a week early because, A, they had finals in their other classes. But also, if there was something egregiously wrong, they had an extra week or two to work on it before we were done done. So week 10, they, we came back and we had another lecture. So on June 10th, I gave a lecture on creating games for the world market, which back then, you know, there was a lot of things people didn't think about. And I'm not just talking about translation, although I'll get to that. I started with talking about violence in art, which were things like showing blood, showing bone, which were legal or illegal in different countries around the world. I talk about violence in deed, such as can you kill children, which some countries said absolutely not, and other countries were like, yeah, we prefer if you didn't, but whatever. And then finally I ended with all the ways that translation issues had to be addressed. This is everything from making sure that you didn't embed text in your code, that you always pulled your strings from a string table, what the formats of those string tables were, there's a million ways of doing it, text length, which is what's the biggest string you can load in and how do you display it? How do you fit it on the screen? Which goes back to the user interface I talked about during week seven. I talked about procedurally string gen procedural string generation, which is creating sentences on the fly, which even if you're not doing procedural dialogue generation, you may need to do procedural string generation with your character's name or strings that you're generating where you're inserting a gender or a reference into that string having to worry about male versus female genders, not for player characters, but also for words and a lot of languages out there that have gendered words. Uh, I talked about special characters, which were extended ASCII, and then multi-byte Unicode, which has now become standard. But back then, people tended to just use ASCII, which was 8-bit, and then they would basically have a lot of pain if they were going to countries that only could use multi-byte characters such as a lot of Asian languages. So that's what we ended up week 10. And I even told them, these are things you didn't know, need to know for this class because you are um, making the game for, for me, I'm the publisher. But once you go out there and get a job, you're gonna be thinking about what do I have to do because my game is gonna go out to the entire world. So that was my 10 week class UCI class ICS 180G spring of 1999. I hope you like this walk down memory lane.